Good stuff. Good morning, everyone, again. Why don't you grab your Bibles with me? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. If you need help finding that, good luck in life. No. Um, uh, that's mean. I'm sorry. Hey, I'm so glad you're here as we continue our financial momentum series. Um, but before I jump into that, just real quick, I just want to say, um, hey, hot off the press, um, uh, this, uh, uh, the kids in the upstairs, first through fifth grade kids' church, it's actually happening starting this morning. Their, their FPU, if you will, their financial teaching, is actually happening this morning, starts this morning. And one thing that goes with that is a weekly devotional that looks something like this. Everyone says, ooh. Yeah, every week your child from that class will be coming home with a devotional that looks like this. It's just a four-day devotional. So um, in the next seven days, can you take some time to work through this with your kids? And um, if, you, if they do do that, and they'll have all this information too, but you can, you can if they bring this uh, signed or something, they'll have the information upstairs. But bring this back, then next week your kid will actually get $5. Now, not 5 five dollar dollar dollars but um, five dollars to be used the October the 13th I believe it is that Sunday you can't go but your kids are gonna be able to use all the money they made for being you know for for following this or whatever they're gonna be able to use that they're gonna have like a big day of fun up there in kids church on that Sunday morning and so anyhow so I just your kids are gonna bring some stuff home today make sure you check it out and um and, you know, so, sometimes people are like, well, why do, you, why do you have gimmicks and why do you do that? Hey, because it works. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad Chad liked it. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. No, it's, it's, hey, listen, if we could come alongside and help you disciple your kids and have some kind of incentive for them. The incentive is October the 13th, you want to have as many dollars as you can. I don't even know what they're calling them, but... We want to have as many as you can because there's going to be a bouncy house, and this bouncy house will cost a couple dollars. So they're learning not only about saving, spending, all the, up in the kids' church, but that day they're actually going to say, hey, you can spend all $25 and bounce all morning. Hello. I mean, like your kid to bounce all morning. Or you can spend $5 on the bouncy house, and then you can spend $5 on a snack, and then you can play this game. for the. So we're, it's not just like a, a party atmosphere. It's like you're, everything you've learned over the past, the principles of Scripture the past few weeks that they're going to learn, they're going to put into action that Sunday. So I think it's, it's something really cool um, that our kids' staff is doing, and so I commend them for that. And I hope that you can come alongside your kids and help them get it figured out. Grab your notes, if you will, because right off the top, we're not going to go any further without you filling in the first blank. You ready for this? Here it is. Wise people save money. That's something no one here would probably disagree with. We just know in the core of our being that saving money is a wise thing to do. I doubt anyone in this room would be like, I did the stupidest thing the other day. Ha! I put $35 in savings. I'm so dumb. Of course you wouldn't. None of us would do that. First of all, you shouldn't talk about yourself like that. You're God's creation. You're not dumb. But beyond that, the fact of the matter is savings is a no-brainer. I think most of us would be like, uh, not most of us, but some of us are sitting there, you're saying like, I just wish I had something to save, and okay, what does that look like, and how to, how to do, do we really not have something to save, and uh, oh, we see in scripture, this is what we see in scripture, Proverbs chapter 24, or excuse me, 21 verse 20, look on the screen, it says, in the house of the who, wise, are stores of choice food and oil, but a what? Foolish man devours all he has. Ooh. Just think about that. Just let that sink in. It, the Bible says that anyone who spends all he has go, is a fool. But, I'm not a big stats person, but I, I'm just going to throw out there, somewhere between 50 to 70% of most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And most, I'm not going to say most, but there's a, a chunk of us here this morning. If you aren't there now, at some point you were. Let's not be thinking too highly of ourselves. And it really doesn't matter how many zeros are after the first number. 
Because you can make over, you can make twenty thousand dollars a year, or you can make one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. But I've talked to people in both situations that still they have nothing left over at the end of the month, and they're living paycheck to paycheck. Right? I just, I, I want you, I want you to think about that. The challenge for me personally, and and if if you're not kind of in the lingo of the FPU language. One of the big steps is, is to get a $1,000 emergency fund, right? To, to get, or if you make, I think it's if it's under 20000 or something like that. If you make 20000 or under in, in a year, then maybe a $500 um, uh, emergency fund. But just something to just get money in savings. Get it there because something's going to happen that you're going to need it for. Now, I don't know about you, but I always struggle beyond there. I mean, for years, we took FBU the, for the first time in like 2006 or something like that. And I, I, we, we can typically get that $1,000 emergency fund, and we've been having an emergency fund for years now, and I love it. But to get beyond there, because they say I need to save three to six months of my, uh, of, of my, my income, you know? So like uh, three to six months income on, in savings is, is another one of the steps, and I just have a hard time doing that. Because that, you, you look at how much money just sitting in savings, and you're just like, ah, I don't, I, you know, you hear a lawnmower calling. Every woman in this place, I know you've been there. <laughs> or you hear this calling, or you see this, or this breaks down, and so and you got the emergency fund, but you got this, and it's so hard to get a pass for me. I'm just being honest with you, just being transparent. But we know this, is that um, uh, uh, Murphy is going to come, right? Something is going to happen. And the majority of us, I, I forget what magazine it was. I got it in my notes here somewhere. Um, but someone did... Did, did the math, and here's, here's the scoop. Um, it doesn't take much, there, there's, it doesn't take much for us to have an emergency that's beyond $1,000, right? I mean, you get a leaky roof and you gotta replace that. You have a couple things go out in your house. You, you, um, your car, you get in an accident or something happens and that's why you have car insurance, right? Because then that takes care of every penny. <clears throat> That you would ever need. No, that, that always just baffles me. And if you're a car insurance salesman, no, no offense or anything. But um, the majority of us are living on the razor's edge of life, just praying that life doesn't happen. But you know, sooner or later, something is going to happen. What is wisdom? What is wisdom? Right now, what is wisdom? Well, wisdom is, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food, but a foolish man devours all he has. Wisdom is to take something and put it aside. You say, well, Scott, I wish I don't... You know, one of the things that, um, that I've really been thinking a lot about since this past week's class, honestly, is when, when Megan and I, we tithe regularly. That's not a shock. All believers who follow us of Christ should do that. We give offerings over and above that. And that's always the first thing we give. I mean, even before we pay Uncle Sam, in a sense, I mean, we, we take that part out. We pay tithe on the whole, but, I mean, that's off the top. We tithe. That's, that's a no-brainer. But um, what my thought was, a lot of times what happens is, okay, let's pay all the bills, get everything paid, then whatever's left over, we might shovel into savings. What, I, what I've been stretched to think about is, what if we were a little more wise with our money, and what if we put savings in right at the top, too? You see what I'm saying? In the house of the wise, how many want to be wise? All of us, we want to be wise. Living paycheck to paycheck, the Bible's pretty clear, it doesn't necessarily call us wise, it calls us foolish. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the foolish because been there, done that, uh, bought the underwear, lived it. I mean, I'm there. I, I understand that. I want to be wise. Let's talk about being wise. What does wise look like? A great example of this is found in Genesis chapter 41. For some reason, I'm in Isaiah. Um, Genesis chapter 41 in the story of Joseph. Here we see Joseph preparing Egypt for the world's greatest famine. It's a long passage, but it's important that we get the gist. So if you don't have a Bible, could you look on your neighbor's Bible? Because I want to read a good chunk of this, starting in verse 15. Can you look with me here? Verse 15. By the way, at the very end of our service this morning, we're going to take communion. And so um, please don't be in a hurry to rush out. We're, that's why we kind of um, cut a little bit short in worship. And so we're going to have some time at the end to take communion. We should have plenty of time to do that. But let's go to, in fact, let's just jump back to verse 14 because I think this is just cool. I don't, know how, I, don't, I don't know how many of you have ever hung out in a dungeon. But uh, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. This is going to come from God. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, moo, fat and sleek, and they gazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean, moo. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after that, after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just, like, uh, just as ugly as before. And then I woke up. In my dreams, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. All after them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin, scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none could explain it to me. And then Joseph, he said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years. And the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years. And so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. There are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten. The famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Let's keep going. Keep going, right? Verse 33. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and a wise man. Put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. Verse 37, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh. Hmm. And to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Hey, Joe. Well, he might not have said that, but it's something like it. Since God has made all this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are submit to your orders. Only with res respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Wow. Verse 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring with his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in, fine, uh, in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck, some bling bling. He had him in a, riding a chariot as his second in command, and men shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. The Pharaoh said to jo Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zephanath Penea and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potipharah, priest of An, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Um, uh, let's sh well, let's keep going. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in these seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born. Uh, keep going, keep going. Verse 53, the seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. Verse 55, when all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. Verse 56, when the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses, sold the grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the world. Whew. Do you get that story? That piece of history? And that's the thing. When you read something in the Bible, you've got to just guard yourself that you're not thinking fable. You're not thinking, oh, that's kind of a cute little something that happened. No, this is history. This is history that happened. So what can we learn what, what three things can we learn about savings from this passage? First thing, fill this in. Ready? Saving money is absolutely necessary. I don't want to scare you, but I'm here to tell you something you can count on. Disaster. <laughs> something is going to happen. You may be sitting right now. You're like, Scott, I'm there. 
there right now. You're in a financial disaster right now. You're struggling right now. You may be better off today than you've ever been. It could be. No matter what's going on in your life, this is what I know. Emergencies are going to happen. Here it is. Money Magazine says, reported that 78% of us will have a major negative financial event in any 10-year period. 7 out of 10 in the course of 10 years. So if you look down the aisle right now and just count 7. Okay, then 3 of you, you're good. <laughs> but the next, uh, not, uh, who wants to be the 3? Let me count here. Okay, uh, okay you got some hands. Just bypass me on that one. Um, seven out of ten people are going to have some kind of a medical emergency, some kind of a something that's going to happen. And you think about even like medical emergency. Not only do you end up then having a, a medical thing, but then you have a financial issue, you have a marriage. I mean, just when money isn't there to pay the bill, stress, I don't have to tell you this, stress goes through the roof. So hear me, I'm not condemning you. I'm not condemning you at all. If you're like, man, right now, if you look at my finances, I fall more towards the foolish side than the wise side. I'm not condemning you. We're just coming alongside you right now, trying to create with biblical principles a little bit of financial momentum. Financial momentum in your life. If, if we line our lives, and I, listen, I, I, our lives up with the Word of God, the principles in the Word, when we line our lives up, that watch as God has a way of providing. One of the things we see out of this passage of Scripture is savings. I, I, I'm not so sure it's optional. If we really want to live wise. I'm not saying that if you don't save, then you're going to hell. Hear me, I'm not saying that. But I'm talking about wisdom. This isn't a salvation issue. This is wisdom issue. The Bible seems to be saying here that it is wisdom for you and I to take a portion, even if it's a small portion, of what we make from week to week, bi-weekly, however you get paid, monthly, whatever, and set it aside because something is going to happen. You're going to have another baby. I prophesy. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Nate and Jan books back there just looked at each other. It's like, no! <laughs> Something's going to happen. You know, we, we ended up having three C-sections, and this is something that came up in our life group, or our small group at at you this past week, um, all three of our kids were C-sections, and you know, those aren't cheap, those are fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000, and if you have insurance, they should cover a chunk of it, and we're blessed with that, but still, you're left with some of the bill, and I, and I think we knew that was coming, we had nine months to plan, but we still, almost every time, had to set up some kind of a payment plan with the hospital to pay off the other twelve, fifteen hundred bucks, or whatever that was ours to pay off, I mean, it's not like it was a surprise, it's like, Man, I wonder how long you're going to have that baby in your womb. But I, nah, it's nine months. But, but, so I, I've been there. I've done that. I understand. But why don't we have money in the bank to take care of these things? You see what I'm saying? What, what could we do? What, what could be more important right now than you and I protecting our family in a sense? I mean, this, this isn't, this is just common sense. And you know it and I know it. it's a whole other thing to do it. How does this relate to the Genesis passage? Let me tell you the situation. Ready? Egypt was one of the richest, most fertile areas in the world. Pharaoh, the absolute monarch of Egypt, the big kahuna, the big cheese, he held total control of the land and the people. His word was law. God's interaction with Pharaoh is really interesting here because Pharaoh had all the power in the land, but the encounter with God left him scratching his head saying, Durr, what's this mean? I don't know what, what, he was forced to look for answers somewhere. He talked to the magicians. He talked to this person. That, nobody could tell him what this means. And then you got three players in this story. Ready? You got Almighty God. Hello. You got a, a seemingly almighty human king. And then what do you got? An imprisoned slave. Did you catch verse 14? I know it was about 50 verses ago, but verse 14, look at that again. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph because he had kind of a record of interpreting dreams, and he was quickly brought up from the where? The dungeon. Ooh. He was even unshaven. It says he shaved. Shave before I see the Pharaoh. I mean, don't you know what we do? We shave before we go see the Pharaoh. But he was down in the dungeon. Here's a prisoner, wrongfully imprisoned. We all know the story. If you don't know the story, go back and read the uh, the couple chapters before and understand what his brothers did to him, all this kind of stuff. He was wrongfully accused, wrongfully imprisoned. But 
but he was the very one that God chose. You know, sometimes we think, who am I? Scott, you don't understand. You don't understand my background. You don't understand how stupid I've been in the past. You know, what I've done, what I... Mm -mm. Once the blood of Jesus comes and forgives you, God's like, what sin? What sin? Oh, sure, there's consequences of sin and some things, but when you, when you get forgiveness from Christ, it's just like, as far as the east is from the west, it's forgiven. And so, um, and so you might be that one that you feel like, I'm living in the dungeon right now. I feel like I'm just going to... And listen, just get ready, because sometimes God says, I I'm, not all, I'm not just looking for the one that's the nicest looking or the cleanest shaven or whatever it may be. I'm looking for the one that I'm looking for. And if he's got to pull you down, go down to a dungeon to find you, he'll do it. We see that God gave Pharaoh a clear message that trouble was coming. His dreams were kind of a warning shot across, the, kind of a red line in the sand. <clears throat> Some of you get that later. Um, Joseph saw this clearly, commenting that these things had been firmly decided by God. You get, catch that? I think it's verse 28 and 32. These things have been firmly decided by God, so you better buckle up, Pharaoh. Pharaoh recognized the urgency. He took steps to manage the crisis in the making. Fact is, here's the, here's just, there will be a crisis. You and I, what can we learn from this? You and I will have a crisis. Something is going to happen. Something's going to happen in life. Okay, so why don't we decide right now to live a wise life? Instead of a foolish one, let's live a wise life. And even if it's just a couple dollars a week, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever it is, start somewhere. Let's start saving. Saving is necessary. Ask yourself, will I be prepared? Will I be ready? Second thing we can learn from this passage is this. Ready? Saving money is a decision. What I found in my life, and even here at the church, is saving money doesn't just automatically happen. The saving money fairy came and saved some money for us. Woo! -hoo. No. <laughs> you know what's funny? We, we've been talking a lot about. I'm so proud of myself. I saved money yesterday. I uh, the girls and I we had to spend a little time with three daughters and we spent time together yesterday giving mom the day off and so we walked into Sam's Club. Here was the goal and I told the girls I said Sam's Club. We love getting the samples. Yes, we do. Um, that just tells you a little about myself, okay? So we're, we, the girls and I, we have a, a day out. We're going to Sam's Club. Oh, yeah. So we're walking through Sam's Club. Of course, I walk through the electronics and look at all the stuff. But, but um, I, we were on a mission. We are on a mission. Mom said we've got $13 to spend on dinner. And we, okay, girls, what can we get for $13? We go to the frozen section, and we're looking around. And wouldn't you know it, they had these self-rising pizzas for $9.99. That meant we still had a couple dollars left over. Savings. Oh, yeah. I'm so proud of us. Hey, now what that has to do, it, there was a decision that had to be made, okay? We had to decide we are not going over $13. That meant that we could buy a dollar snack when we went to Target. I mean, I tried to make it a big deal, and it, it ended up being kind of fun, actually. Um, but uh, I'm glad I don't have to do that every week. My, I'm blessed my wife takes care of the groceries because that would stress me out. But this, it's a decision to save. It's a decision to save. We have to make a decision that if we're going to be wise, we're, we're going to save. Joseph didn't just tell Pharaoh that trouble was coming. No, he said, look in verse 33. He says, and now let, let Pharaoh look for a, a smart guy. Find somebody. And this is what it ought to look like. You ought to have someone plan this out. and put, You know, when we're having this seven years of great abundance, put stuff away, 20% away for in the future. When faced with the realization that Egypt would flourish for seven years and then face a famine for another, another seven years, Joseph said, this is what we need to do, Pharaoh. Save, save, save. Don't stop saving. Joseph didn't suggest that each individual, individual farmer should just, hey, just do your best to put something away. No, he even came out and said, let's save 20%. Let's take 20% of grain that's going to be harvested on the, this good year, this good year, for these seven years of good. Let's take 20% and put it away. This was, in a sense, their emergency fund to be used only during famine. Joseph, he was like the original model nerd. He was gifted with the gift of nerd. Um, he suggested further that someone be put in charge to make this saving, to make sure this happens. 
And um, uh, notice three things about his plan. He says this, it, it was written down, it had built-in accountability, and it had the full support of Pharaoh. So everyone was on board. There was accountability, it was written down. This sounds a lot to me like a budget. Can we move on? Um, the third thing, <laughs> yeah. You know what? Um, we're, we talk about this, of course, in FBU, but th- let me just encourage you. Get a plan. I don't like a plan any more than you. The first few years of our church, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you, we didn't have a budget at this church. We're just like, is the money there? Okay. <laughs> is it not there? Okay. We, but in the early days of our church, we, uh, we didn't even understand. I didn't even understand. And, you know, for years now we've had a budget, and um, it still is, is not the most enjoyable thing, but it's a necessary thing. Can I just encourage you, if you haven't been, get it on paper. Tell your money where, I think Larry Burkett, the Christian financial guy, he's, he's passed on to heaven now, but he says, a budget is simply telling your money what to do instead of wondering where it went. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I worked on a, uh, we have a budget, first of the year, Megan and I, we have this budget, whatever. I worked on our budget again this week because it's part of our homework. I'm a good boy, I want to do the homework. And so I was working on the budget, kind of a quick budget. And, you know, I, I found, man, we, we, have, we have some significant amount of money that's un, unbudgeted. I mean, at the end of a month, when we look at how much money, income we have, and how much the, the basic expenses, I'm like, where's all the rest of this money go, you know? I, I, you might be surprised, and I hope you are surprised, and you're, you learn something as you take time just to sit down and budget and just say, okay, really? I could live on that? Are you kidding me? Well, where's the rest of this money going? Put it on paper. I think it's Dave Rams. He said, one definition of maturity is learning to delay pleasure. Children do what feels good. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Let's be adults. Let's get a plan. Let's stick to the plan, but let's decide that we are going to do it. Joseph, Pharaoh, they decided here is the plan. We can talk about getting financial momentum in our lives, allowing God's principles to saturate not just our spiritual life, but every single area of our life. I don't have my wallet on me, but uh, pretend I did. Um, uh, uh, Your wallet, that God, I want your principles in the way I handle my finances. Here it is. I lift my finances to you, God. We can talk about it all we want, but until we decide that we're going to make some changes and allow God to renew our mind. I, I can remember to this day sitting at the dining room table and my dad saying, I hate credit cards. I hate credit cards. I hate credit cards. And I understand why now. Because, um, you know, as I'm, as I'm in the line buying my books in college at a Bible college nonetheless, right there it sits Discover Card. We'd like to give you a card. You, Discover Card, wanted to give me a credit card? It was 1992. I was young. I was only 17 years old at that point. And I was like, you want to give me? Oh, I am privileged. You give students credit? Oh, I pulled that puppy out and I signed it. I was so honored that Discover Card, the card that pays you back, supposedly. (coughs) And I sent it in and I got suckered into that. And suddenly, over the next few years, I realized, I understand why my dad sat at the table and said, I hate credit cards. Because credit cards, I mean, I, 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 listen, credit cards are, are one of those things that um, uh, you chop them up, whatever. The, the fact of the matter is this. Um, it, it's, it's getting yourself into bondage. Getting yourself into debt. And, and buying things that you can't afford in the first place. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But you have to decide. This is, this is, what, this is what even my wife, because I've told you before, in every marriage there's typically a saver and there's a spender. Megan is a um, uh, poor gal. She's a saver. I'm the spender. I'm just joking. She, she's a saver. She's a spender. And us coming together was a good thing because um, what she helps to – I help in that we actually go out and buy things that we need. <laughs> she helps because she restrains us from buying things that we don't need, and we work together on that, and sometimes it's more like this, but we work together. Um, but uh, understand, we had to make a decision. I had to make a decision that I, w- I don't want to be sitting um, in a place where I have all this debt, and I pass that on to my children, et cetera, et cetera. Even not just passing the debt, but the thought process has to be uprooted 
I, that whole idea that I can just take plastic and go get whatever I want, that has to be uprooted. That, that is a spiritual bondage. That's what I want to talk to you about. We have to decide today, in a sense, as for me and my house, <laughs> we will be wise with our money. We will live wise. The storehouse, that savings that they had, you have to decide to save, putting that aside. It was for emergencies. Joseph didn't sneak in a few times a week and just grab himself a sandwich or, <laughs> or whatever it was. <laughs> he's, not, he's not like tapping into that. For, it was for a specific purpose. That savings was there for an emergency. Now let's go to the last thing, and then we're going to get into communion. Third thing we learn about saving the, for this passage of Scripture is maybe one of the most enjoyable parts of this whole message. So I'm so glad you stuck with me. Because remember, God working in your finances is never just about you. Saving money protects your loved ones and those around you. Discipline savings adds up quickly. Here in Genesis chapter 41, you look at verse 48. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Have any of you ever reached that point in your personal savings? Not yet? You'll get there. Right? Man, I just got so much in savings, I just have no idea. I just stopped keeping track of it. I don't even need to keep track of that. No, I don't think any of us have quite reached that point. But here's the miracle. And you got to get this. By saving only 20% of the crops during the seven years of plenty, Joseph had more grain than he knew what to do with. Think about that. For seven years, they saved 20% a year for seven years, and that covered 100% of their need for the next seven years. How is that possible? Because God was involved. I don't understand it either. I want to make sure you get that, because this is the miracle of how I've seen, even in my own life, how God has used savings. The first seven years, they have plenty. Now, even if they had plenty, 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 <laughs> I still don't see it mathematically. This first year, you take 20%, put it away. Second year, 20%. All the way seven years, they take 20%, put it away. Then the next seven years, this year, we're going to live off of the first year's 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. Now, there's a lot of things you can read in that, but one thing I read into it is miracle. I can't understand it, but I can testify to it. You know, I think Dave Ramsey um, talked about it this past week. It's like Murphy's Law, you know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, and, and, or something along those lines. Um, but here's the deal. Murphy, when you have that emergency fund, this is what seems to happen. Murphy comes to your front door and sees, oh, you got an emergency fund? I'll go to your neighbor's house <laughs> and goes to the next house. I can't understand it, but I, I can tell you I have lived it. I have lived it. The moment my wife and I started putting money away in savings, and had that emergency fund sitting there, it seemed like we had less and less issues with our appliances going bad. And, and, and let me just throw this out to you. Every time your water heater goes out, doesn't mean the devil's attacking you. <laughs> you ever just, uh, sometimes we hyper-spiritualize it. Well, the, 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 the enemy's really coming against me, and my gas ran out the other day, and, I, and my refrigerator, and then the dog got sick, and, and then it's all over the carpet, and now i got to clean the carpet, and the devil's just attacking me. Okay. I'm not saying that sometimes the devil doesn't work like that, but let's just phrase it. Sometimes things give out. And so, um, so we need to have a plan. We need, but I'm telling you, I don't understand it, but I have experienced this very same miracle. The storehouse was completely full. They couldn't even measure how much they had. This is a result of persistent, regular giving. You, you, you just make it a part of your daily life. What was the result of this? Egypt. Pharaoh, Joseph became known for wise savings. And all people came. Even you read on in the story, you see how Joseph even took care of his own brothers. And how because of this miracle, God created the miracle of him coming back to his family and his brothers re-engaging there. I, I mean, just it's, it's a, one miracle after another that you can trace all the way back to one decision, and that was what? To save. To save. The nation only survived because somebody was silly enough to say okay it doesn't look it looks like everything's great seven years of just great abundance let's this is going to keep going isn't it you kidding me just 
I mean, and, and we're in a, in a community that's kind of like that at times, right? I mean, if RVs are flying out of the, the factories and, hey, come on, you kidding me? We'll just go spend, 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 spend. Well, let's just, let's be wise. And let's be wise. Even when we're in a, a season of just where it seems like we're blessed and blessed, let's be saving some away, saving some away. The only difference in savings and hoarding is your attitude. Just think about that. Well, Scott, I feel a little guilty. Everyone's, this person is needy and this person is needy. And I, I just, here's, here's the difference. Listen, if you put money aside for the purpose of taking care of your family, having cash on hand to help others, being able to provide for your family, pay for college, whatever, that, that is clearly savings. If you put money aside so that you can have more, you can do more, and you can have more than your neighbors, and it's self-centered, that's hoarding. And this is the crazy thing. Saving empowers giving. How often have you wanted to give or help somebody, but you couldn't because you just didn't have it to give? What would it be like to have the freedom to give generously, not worry about having enough money to pay the car loan or the mortgage bill? I want to share one more proverb with you. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Check this out. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. You know what? I, I, is this in your notes? At least the, 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 the Proverbs 13, 22 is in your notes. I really want you to meditate on this. And I want you to pray over this this week. I, I, I want to leave an inheritance for my kids. And I'm not even saying like some big, huge chunk of money, though that'd be really cool. But, you know, my parents were just regular middle-class people, and I would never put ourselves at all in a category of rich. But we're, we were blessed. We had clothes. We had a house. We're, we're, we're okay. But, you know, even when my parents passed, they had a plan. There was an inheritance that any, the, anything that they did have, of course, was split up amongst four kids. But they had already thought through that, hey, we want the kids to be able to go to college. So that was at the top of the list. So I, the, the, the fact that I could walk away from college after four years and not have any debt, they, you have no idea, unless you've been there and done that, what an inheritance and a blessing that was. I mean, especially in today's economy. I mean, today's college prices, right? I mean, there are certain things that my parents did years and years and years ago that were, and I, I think about myself. I think about it myself. What, am, what do I have that I'm going to pass on to my kids? A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, not just my kids, but even beyond that. The Bible says it's not wise to spend every dime I make. We have a responsibility to our families, to our future generations, to turn back the tide of debt wastefulness, consumerism. And I'm not just talking even just, I mean, I would love to be at a point someday that whenever I'm gone, my kids are blessed financially. I, I would love to have that. But the fact of the matter is, even if that doesn't happen, even maybe more importantly, let's pass on uh, 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 an inheritance to our children of this is how you handle money. This is how you, you, you live with wisdom and not with foolishness. Listen, we've all been there and done that on the foolish thing, but let's be committed to pass on an inheritance to our kids, an inheritance of blessing, even in our thought processes, spiritually. Spiritually. What about a spiritual inheritance? I can't help but to throw that in there. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children. What kind of a spiritual godly legacy and inheritance are you passing on your kids? They're, they're going to follow you. They're going to uh, better caught than taught. What about the importance of coming to worship on Sunday mornings? Are, are you teaching your kids the priority? This, this is what, let me just throw this out because uh, I think Meng and I were talking about this this week, but this is one of the tragedies that I see in the local church right now. Church is just another thing I do. We got this club, and, and even I understand your kids are busy with swimming or soccer or volleyball or tennis or, I mean, just wh whatever it is, just add it in there and, and, you know, I'm a part of this thing, and I'm a part of this thing, and, and I'm a part of church, too. I'm church, just right here, this, 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 this. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says, don't forsake the assembling of the swim team, <clears throat> or the soccer team, or the tennis team, or the family reunion, or whatever it is. I mean, just, it says, don't forsake the assembling. Don't stop getting together weekly. There needs to be a weekly assembling of the local body of believers coming together. Local church is up here. 
because it's God's plan. Now listen, you know, Megan and I love to travel. We love taking our kids to travel as much as we can afford. We love going. And so we miss Sundays too when we're gone. And I understand that. But let's make sure that we're passing on an inheritance to our kids as they grow up. That church isn't just something that we just throw in the mix. Church is something that's priority. Being a part of a local church is priority. Let's pass on a spiritual heritage. We have families all throughout this church, and you've done a great job of that. And I commend you for it. We have, we have parents in this place that your kids are now a part of our church, grown kids that are now a part of our church too, because you've taught them, and they've caught it. They've caught it somewhere along the line. It, it's more than mom and dad are making me come to church. It's, now you know what? This is Sunday morning. We're going to come and we're going to worship together because they've passed on that spiritual inheritance. I, I'm, I'm just talking this on my heart. Let me just, just encourage you that. Let's make sure, though, that uh, we understand. When we shovel away, shovel away, <laughs> when we put away a portion of savings, God can do a miracle with that. God can do things and multiply it bless that to help take care of the needs and the things and let's be committed to changing the generations from here on out because trouble's coming hallelujah i receive it there can be little doubt that something's going to happen the house is going to need maintenance unfortunately the deck is going to need to be cleaned and restained and possibly rebuilt the <laughs> The shed is going to fall over. <laughs> the water heater is going to just start leaking. And what's going to happen is they're going to come to fix the water heater, and they're going to look at something on your furnace, and they're going to be like, something doesn't look right here. That's what happened to me. Someone gave me a free water heater one time. I said, yeah, I heard you need a water I need a water heater. Hey, they said, well, okay. So they got the water heater in the basement. And then the, the guy, while he's putting in the water, he's like, so your furnace doesn't look right. He's so like, man, if you weren't my pastor, I would like not leave this house with power being on this furnace because you're like filling your house with carbon monoxide. I was like, <gasps> and so all of a sudden I got a free water heater, but I ended up paying 1500 bucks for my furnace. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Stuff like that's going to happen. Um, wise people save money. Uh, I, I, just, I feel like as I'm talking today, it's coming out and it's coming right back into my own ears, okay? I'm talking to myself here. Wise people save money because there's going to come, it's, it's going to happen. And I think sometimes we get on the emergency side. It's like, please pray with me, the Lord would provide. And we're going to pray with you and we'll keep praying with you. We're going to trust God and that we're going to learn. But let's learn. Can we learn on this side? Because we wait until we need it. It's like, oh, God, provide, provide, provide. And sometimes I just wonder if God's not saying, I did. I did. I did provide. And it would have meant that you would have had to give up your 24-pack of Coke Zero. It would have meant that that movie you shouldn't have gone to, uh, nothing against, as long as it's a clean, okay, but, uh, okay. It, it would have meant that that one thing, you, you know, maybe you need to start shopping at this store instead of that store. I know you love that store, but this store is cheaper, I'm just telling you. It's just a, like God really cares, but I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I wonder sometimes if God doesn't look down at the knucklehead Scott and say, listen, you're praying to me, asking me for me to, but I've already provided and and what the way I wanted to provide was that as I provide for you, just take a portion and just put it in the savings because this is going to happen. Above all, here's, here's the above all. Ready for this? Honor God with your finances. Let everything that you do bring honor and glory to Him. Above all, savings, everything. Honor God with your finances. Saving money is absolutely necessary. Saving money is a decision. Saving money protects your family and those around you when you and I are committed and disciplined to save. Ouch. Man. I, I hope you come back next week after that one. <laughs> I'm telling you, though, I was preparing for next week's message already this week. It's a humdinger. I'm telling you, I, I would not miss next Sunday because I'm telling you, I, I really, in fact, when I started going, I, I started preaching that one as I was going over my notes last. I think I might preach, 
I, I, you know, I, I go through every message a couple times, make sure I got it, and I don't have to be so close to my notes. But, um, but man, it's, it's a humdinger. You don't want to miss next Sunday. It's going to be good. But today, let's not bypass this one. Savings, savings, savings. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. The, the amount that you save, what you do in savings may look different than other people. But let's just, let's just be committed to be people of savings. Speaking of savings, I mean, have you experienced the salvation of Jesus Christ? I mean, seriously, the ultimate savings is the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sin. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, when you give your life to Christ, you know what? The Bible talks about it being the abundant life. Abundant life. When you give your life to Christ, you get this abundant life. And, and I can testify to that, and, and, and I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in my life. But the, the, main, the main bottom line it for me, why do I need Christ? Why do I need it? It's because you and I are born sinful. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You and me. Every one of us, we've come short of the glory of God. We have sin in our heart. And that means my heart is black and ugly. And I, I, I mean that just like dirty because of my sin. I was born into sin. No one had to teach me to sin. It was just my natural thing. I just sinned. I just pinched my sisters or whatever. I mean, I just, as a little kid, I just did it. I sinned. I sinned. We've all born into sin. And that's why we, the only way to deal with that sin issue is Jesus Christ. What he did for you on the cross, willingly. <laughs> I mean, literally, when you give your life to Christ, if you were to stand before God today, he wouldn't say, oh, yeah, you're good enough. Yeah, good job. No, he'd say, oh, you're in it because of the blood of Jesus that's in your life. Because you allow Jesus Christ to be your righteousness. You will never be good enough for Jesus or for God. You in yourself will never be good enough to stand before God and at the judgment seat of Christ and, and, and for you to be uh, to make it to heaven. You'll never be good enough. It's only through Jesus Christ and accepting what he did for you on the cross. That's the only way. And if you have yet to give your life to Jesus right here, right now is the time to do that. Would you close your eyes with me? Worship team, would you come and the ushers are going to prepare Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for, for, for your word that talks to us about saving. <laughs> God, your word never ceases to amaze me. How practical and the things that we can get out of your word. God, I thank you. that I mean, you could have just left us and said, hey, do your best. But instead, you gave us your word. God, as a church, we're committed to change through practical Bible teaching. And so today, we just commit ourselves to be people of savings. God, renew our mind in this area. Give us a hatred for debt and a love for savings. <laughs> God, help us just to understand what happens when we start putting things away in savings, how that opens the door for your kingdom to come in a greater way in our lives. God, there's people sitting here, though, they're saying, man, I don't even have a job right now. Or then put inside of their heart a commitment right now. The next time I have a job, I'm going to say, even if it's just $5 a week, I'm going to just put it away. I'm going to trust God. It's going to bless that and multiply that. And help me, not just to hoard my money, but to provide for me later on. And God, I just, I, I pray for those that do have a job, no matter how small it is, God, that you just put a resolve in their heart to be savers. So that as you supply now, we can be blessed by that later on. And so God, I just pray beyond that though, Lord. I, I just pray right now for every person in this room, people who have yet to give their lives over to you and invite you to be their Lord and their Savior. God, in a moment we're going to take communion, but before we do that, right now we just want to settle in our hearts salvation. God, I just pray for that person here today. Would you give them the boldness to say, yeah, I need Jesus. I need to get right with Jesus. I have a sin problem and I realize I've been trying to deal with it on my own or whatever. I need Jesus to deal with my sin today. In Jesus' name. Would you just keep your eyes?